Matthew chapter number 20. Now to give you all a little bit of context, at the end of chapter number 19, Peter says to the Lord, Lord, we've forsaken all, we've left everything to follow after you, be faithful. He says, what shall we have when it comes to the other side? What's our reward for forsaking everything? Jesus tells him, well, there are going to be 12 thrones in heaven and y'all going to get one. Okay? Then, chapter number 20 comes around. We get a parable of the laborers at the beginning of the chapter. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a vineyard where the master is looking for workers. He goes out early in the day. He hires some workers. Then at the about every three hours he goes out and he sees there's still more work to do in the vineyard than what those people are going to be able to do. So he goes back into town and he keeps hiring more and more people that are looking for work. Then at the end of the day, they all get paid the same amount. They said, I hired them for a day's labor. labor. It doesn't matter that they only work an hour. I said, I'll give you a penny to come and work just for a little bit. Right? The kingdom of heaven, right, doesn't matter when you got saved, whether you was on the front end or the back end. Right? Our reward is the same, not because we've labored the same amount, but because we each put the same amount of faith into Christ. Amen. It is our faith that is rewarded. Okay? It is our faithfulness that will be put on display when we stand before one of the thrones one of these days and we're judged for the deeds that were done in our body right we are not being judged by the time that we invested we are being judged by how much of ourselves we invested into Christ and how much we let Christ work himself in our life as that new creature but that's the parable then Jesus foretells verse number 17 he says, going up to Jerusalem. Okay, he says, where I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles to be scourged and to be crucified. Okay, then, verse number 20, says that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, their mama comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if thou wilt, I'd ask you one thing. And he said, what do you want? She said, James and John told me about how they're going to get one of them thrones in heaven. She says, if it's possible, can they sit on your left hand and your right hand? And he says, I can't do that. And he says, I can't do that because that's not my decision to make. The Father's the one that's got control over all of that. And he says, they've got a throne. But I, I don't know where they're going to sit. Later on, come to find out, there's coming a day that you'll get to sit in his throne with him for all of us. All right, but... He says, you know not what you ask. Verse number 22. Basically, he says, in the nicest way possible, that's a dumb question. Doesn't matter. Okay? But the other ten, they get a little jealous because they weren't listening to the answer. They just thought that because it was James and John that Jesus was going to give them a special seat in heaven. They get a little backwards, right? A little bit bitter. Then, it says in verse number four, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren, right? They was ready to whoop them. Well, we're going to begin reading in verse number 25. It says, but Jesus called, unto him, called them unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are great, and that they are great exercise authority upon them but it shall not be so among you but whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister and whomsoever will be the chief among you let him be your servant even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many and as they departed from Jericho a great multitude followed him now Jesus nips it all in the bud right here and he says hey whoa 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 he said, we just heard about the parable. How all the laborers got paid the same amount. Because in the eyes of the master, they all did the same work. It doesn't matter how long some of them did it. They all were contracted by the owner of the house for a penny as the payment. 
to come and work at his vineyard. That don't care who you are. Everybody, as long as you got washed in the blood, you got a mansion in glory. Amen. That don't care who you are. Don't care when you got saved. Don't care how long you've been in the race. You got the same amount of the Holy Ghost as anybody else did when they got saved. You're going to receive the same inheritance, right? Because the Holy Ghost was the earnest of the promise that we've received. You're going to get the same inheritance that everybody else gets in glory. We've all been made joint heirs with Christ. But see, now they're not talking about payment. Now they're talking about positioning. The other ten get a little backwards because they think, well, obviously, James and John's mom thinks that they're the two best disciples that exist because she's asking for the two best seats in glory. Well, I'm pretty convinced we all going to get a good seat in glory. Okay, but they've already been promised one of, but now we know, it's one of the 24 thrones in heaven. You've got the 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament. You've got the 12 New Testament apostles. They've got a throne that only 23 other people besides them get to sit in. And it wasn't because there's something special. It's because they were, by faith, willing to follow after God. You know why? It's Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and Nathaniel, and we can go. Why all the Old Testament patriarchs? You know why? Because God walked by their way one day and asked them to follow him. That's what it all boils down to. That's not up to us, or that's not up to how much effort or how much went into your spiritual life. That's just God chose. That, it was God's will. Just as much as it was God's will for you to get saved, it was just as much God's will for Peter to be one of the apostles. It doesn't. That's why he gets that seat. It's not because Peter did anything special. It's because Peter was picked. All right, we all on the same page so far? Okay. Jesus says, why are y'all getting in a tizzy? He says, you do realize because you guys, right up to this point, they're still the disciples, but he says, there's only 12 of you guys on the whole earth. One of them, even though he's been promised a throne in heaven, is about ready to betray Jesus. That's not like Judas didn't know what was waiting on the other side if he stayed faithful. He had been promised great riches, but 30 pieces of silver was worth more to him than a throne in heaven. There's a whole other story, a whole other lesson than that. But anyway. Okay, there's only 12 of them. He had other disciples. We know that he sent 70 out two by two. But no, these were the disciples. These were, as long as they remain faithful, going to be the 12 apostles. Right? These guys were getting ready to do things, and they had already seen things and heard things nobody else had ever heard before. They literally walked and talked and lived with God in the flesh for some three and a half years. Everywhere he went, they went. Every meal they ate was provided by the providence of God. Right? They lived with God for three and a half years. And they're getting ready to, as the apostles in the early church, do things that nobody even thought would be a possibility. They had abilities that nobody else had. They could heal. They could preach in their language and somebody else understand in their language. Okay, those were the gifts of the Holy Spirit back then. But, what Jesus is telling them in these verses, okay, he says, you know, verse number 25, that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and that they are great exercise authority upon them. He says, the Gentiles, the way that you guys are thinking about it, is that somebody's given a throne and they're given power. He says, that's not how the kingdom of heaven works. He says, you think that a throne is going to give you dominion over somebody else. 
He says, you think that if your throne is closer to Jesus in heaven than somebody else's throne, it means you get to tell the other person what to do. He says, this is not how the kingdom of heaven works. He said, verse number 26, but it shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. He says, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. He says, if you want a throne in glory, he says, I've already promised you one. He says, but if you want it, if you want to claim it, it's not about exercising authority over somebody else. He said, it's about making yourself as small as you can possibly get. He says, you get a throne in glory because it is expected of you that you're to fade to the background and Christ is supposed to shine through you. He says, you're only going to get in the way. He says, those that want to be elevated in God's economy have to make themselves very small in their own eyes. He says, they have to be willing to make themselves very humble in the eyes of others. You know what minister and serve mean? It means that the other person is more important or more valued than yourself. To minister unto someone, that means that you're making sure that they have need of nothing. To serve another person is to put yourself in subjection to the other person, whether it's for a time or for a long time, right? But whatever it is that you need, I will serve. Even if you have what you need, I'll be the one that delivers it to you, that literally serves it onto the plate for you. I will be your hands so that your hands don't have to move. He says, if you want God to think highly of you, that's the kind of Christian that you've got to be. He says, it's not about authority. I mean, let's be honest. I know that people nowadays, right, some 2,000 years later, we all think that there's a oh, well, that person has the ability to do this or to do that, or they have the authority to go out and do this or do that. That's not how the church works, not according to the Bible. You know who has all authority over the church? Christ, because he paid for it. Amen. And anybody else in here that's ever contributed one cent to pay for the sins that were washed away so that Christ could form the church? Amen. Okay, don't care about the land, don't care about the building. Don't care how much somebody gave. You know what all that is? God gave it to you because he trusted you with it so that it would be around so that God's house could get built. I don't find one place where Solomon or David claimed ownership over any part of the temple in Jerusalem because their funds were the ones that went to pay for the materials and the laborers and they were the ones that oversaw its construction. No, it was always referred, referred to as the house of God. It was his. Those things were given. If you give it, you have no ownership over it anymore. Okay, well, he says, in God's economy, all authority comes from where? Top down. In the Bible, they were in, talking about the local church, authority comes from God through Christ because he's the one who paid for it okay, delivered via the Holy Ghost right, either through the word or through prayer us talking back to God he will make the will of God discerned but authority in the church stops at one place it's called the pastor he said well brother Jordan what about deacons over there? deacons were to be help meets to the pastor they were supposed to carry about the ministerings of the church. Study it out. That's why Stephen and the first group of deacons were picked to make sure that all the needs of the members of the church were met. Why? So that the men of God could find the mind of God, that they'd be given over to study and to meditation upon the things of God, so that they would be able to get up and to say, Thus saith the Lord, with authority. Anything else is because God permits it. But we know that even in, I mean, consider the early church of Jerusalem. 
tens of thousands of people, some people estimate, members of that first local church. Right? You think that one preacher is going to be able to preach and that many people here, not outside of the power and the unction of God? What they do? They met daily in houses. Now granted, they had 12 preachers that they could go around and, well, 11, because the Apostle Paul's a lot of times on mission trips. Okay, they've got 11 preachers, but still, how many houses you got to visit to make up, let's just say, 10,000 members? Right? And you only got six days before you got to start the cycle over again. Where in there do you have time to pray and to study? Right? That was their whole job. That's why the deacons were getting, so that they would be free to continue the work of the Lord. Now, consider, even in a church our size, right? one man cannot minister unto all on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why God's given our pastor the ability to set up associates. And like Brother Ron, okay, Brother Ron, shut-ins for people that are sick, people that are in the hospitals. He's got a burden to go help, you know, minister unto those people. He's not going to say, hey, you missed church and I'm here to collect your tide check. Okay? No, he's going to be a help to those people. Okay, then we got Brother Adrian. Okay, another associate. Over all of the education around here. Not just Bible college, Sunday school, everything else. Right, that is a load off of your pastor. Right, just consider. Anybody in here ever ordered Sunday school materials before? Yeah, some. But if you haven't, where in the world are you going to go to find a KJV only, doctrinally cor correct Sunday school material? Right, because just because they sold it there at the place you bought it from last year doesn't mean they still got it this year. World's flakier than anybody. Right? And let alone maintaining the schedule of, well, this one started on this quarter, this class started on this quarter, that's when we've got to. Right? We've been blessed around here that God's given seasoned men to the church, that our pastor had peace of God, to feel that God said, it's okay to let them take care of it. You know what that's called? That's called bearing one another's burdens. That's called everybody getting involved in the church. It's about as being fitly framed together. Okay, but the pastor has the authority. Okay, now I do not believe that either one of these men would ever do one of these things. Okay, otherwise I wouldn't use this example right now. But if either one of them stood up and said, I believe that this is what the church needs to do, that's out of order. It's God's will for the church to do this. No, that's got to come through the pastor. Okay, we've got, they're both in our Sunday school class. One of them's hiding up in the crow's nest. Right? But our deacons are true servants. They never want to be seen. They never want to be heard. I've argued with both of them before when I've been out of town. Like, hey, would you ever want to teach the Sunday school class one Sunday? Both of them. No, don't want to do it. Get out of here. Stop asking me. They don't want to be seen. You know what they want to be? They want to be a help. Amen. They go around not to embarrass anybody. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. They just walk up and say, hey, is there anything that I can do for you? Right? That's scriptural. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know why all of the people that we've just talked about have been given those positions? It's because a long time ago they found out it's better to minister and it's better to serve than to lord over people. Okay, you show me a local Baptist church where there are hirelings and there are lords that are wielding authority over people to put people into subjection, I'll show you a church that's not scripturally correct. That is not how the local church is supposed to be maintained and operated. According to your Bible. According to your Bible, we are to edify others. All judgment, all authority has been committed unto Christ. You know what judgment we deliver? What he delivered to us. What's written right here. There's no new 
no new interpretation. I don't care how good of a preacher you are. I don't care how mean or angry or spit-fueled you can be preaching into somebody's face. There's nobody that can preach conviction onto somebody. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. If God trusted man to have authority over overseeing the office work of the church, then people would be in charge of convicting other people. God knew he couldn't trust people to do that. That's why he gave the job to himself through the person of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one that illuminates the true meaning of the... I don't care how smart you are. You can't teach the Word of God to somebody to where they'll understand it. Don't care how good a teacher you are. You know why? Because the Bible says that the Word is spiritually discerned. Doesn't matter how well you know it. What matters is how well you can hook up with the Holy Ghost and serve as a vessel for somebody to learn. If you think that you're going to teach them, it ain't going to get done. But if you say, Lord, use me to get the point across so that you can teach them, then business might be ready to pick up. Too much has been given over in the modern day church period to where we think that without our efforts, God can't do it. God could have done it all without us. They proved that when it came to salvation. You weren't involved in it at all. He could have made the whole church like that. But no, he said, salvation is given by grace through faith. But not of yourselves. What was it? It was a gift. Salvation was a gift. Being a member of a church is a choice. That we are. I hope this isn't a surprise to anybody in here. But you know what the two requirements are to be a member of a local church? body of believers according to your Bible you got to be saved and then you got to be baptized baptism got nothing to do with salvation but it's got a lot to do with the membership in the church you know why because that baptism is a public statement that anybody can come and see that you are testifying that you have died out to sin and been raised in newness of life with Christ in order to be a member of a church you've got to be willing to make that proclamation no, I'm not like the world. I'm like Christ now. But when you really boil it down, that's why baptism, by submersion, not by sprinkling, is a requirement to be a member of the church. Because it is you not saying that you're getting a second portion of salvation. No, no, no. I've been saved, but I want to be identified with Christ. Amen. I want to claim the fact that he's given me a new robe to wear that he set me down among a new group of people. That is your outward testimony that, yep, it isn't just something on the inside. I want what he did on the inside to show on the outside. But that's what baptism, that's why your membership, if you didn't receive the scriptural baptism, you didn't make the proclamation correct. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean that you weren't a member at the church before. It's just saying if we want to do things the Bible way, that's what baptism is. I'm not what I used to be. I'm something different. Amen. Because who in their right mind would let somebody join any organization without some sort of statement from the person saying, yeah, I really want to be here. Yeah, I'm willing to hook up with y'all. To bear the burden. That's what that says. The church covenant. We taught on that a long time ago. But all that says is, these are the things that I am willing, able, and ready to perform as a member of this church. And we went through on how all of them are scriptural. None of that is holding anybody to a standard other than Christ. Which is the standard that Christ gave us himself. But we're not going to teach on any of that. That's just how things are supposed to be in the church. What I want to look at, verse number 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. Name one time in your Bible through the Gospels 
or through any of the prophecy of the end times or of heaven or anywhere else that Christ ever showed up and said, I'm here for you to give me something. Name one. Can't find it. You're always going to find that he was giving knowledge, instruction, about giving healing, spiritual blessings. Okay, he's touching the flesh and making it whole so that somebody can clue in to Jesus is what they need for their spiritual condition too, not just their fleshly condition. He came as a what lamb? But while he was here, you know what he did? He served. He ministered. He met the needs of other people. Y'all remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Remember where Moses and Elijah came down? And what they do? They ministered unto Christ. You really think that Jesus needed Mary Magdalene and the other ladies that followed around to minister unto Christ? You really think he needed the disciples to go out and to spread the news of what Christ was doing in the area? No. Before he ever preached his first message, there were angels on a hillside to talk to a bunch of shepherds saying, hey, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that y'all been waiting on for so long, the one that Isaiah called the Prince of Peace, he down there in that village. He was just born. Jesus didn't need anybody. Didn't need to be ministered unto. You know why Christ suffered it to be so? Because he knew that by someone ministering unto him that they were doing more good to the Father's cause. Jesus didn't want to rob somebody else of blessing in heaven because he didn't receive their gift. God doesn't need your gift. God doesn't need what it is that you're going to sacrifice unto him. You know why he permits it to be so? Because he knows that by doing so, you are investing in the kingdom of heaven. He'll never stop anybody from investing themselves into what God started in them. Christ knew that in order to be Christ-like, you must minister. You must become a servant. But it says he came to be a minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Doesn't it just make sense that if his whole reason for coming was to lay down his life for others, that before that day came, his life would be completely devoted to giving unto others, to meeting the needs of others, to making sure that the blessings that God had given to somebody were not hindered in that person receiving them. That's what being a servant is. Just because God blessed you with it doesn't mean that you can use it. Sometimes you need a servant to come by and help you with it. Servant doesn't stay. Minister doesn't stay. Their roles are temporary. But while they're there, you know what they're willing to do? Whatever God wants them to. They make no conditions about it. But it's that phrase that he came to give his life ransom for many. You know what that phrase means? Literally it means that he came to be the payment that many could not pay. His life, robed in flesh, right? he was all God, but he was also all man. We've already mentioned it. He was a lamb. His whole purpose was to be offered up for others. Every breath he took, he took it because he knew that if he stopped breathing, the payment wouldn't have been made on your account. Every step he took was to fulfill the will of the Father so that not one jot, not one tittle of the law would be unfulfilled. He didn't do it for his own sake. He did it for your sake. Everything he did, it had the focus and it had the overall purpose of becoming a ransom or a payment for your sins. 
it says that because of that, go back and read the beginning of verse number 28. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life ransom. The two were not dependent upon one another. He could have come, lived a sinless, perfect life, paid for sin, and not ministered unto anybody. Like I said, he didn't need anybody as part of his earthly ministry. He could have done it all on his own. He didn't need people to minister unto him. The Father could have ministered unto the Son. But it says that he came to minister and to become a ransom. We got a great church. We got a lot of people that serve around here. We got a lot of people that are willing to minister unto the needs of others. But I wonder how many of us, after we got saved, were willing to look at the Lord and say, Lord, make me a ransom for somebody else. You say, what's the difference, Brother Jordan? There's a big difference. See, if you're the payment that somebody else needs, it means that you give up all authority over your life. You know what the son did? What the father told him to do. He came to do the will of the father. You know what a minister does? What they're expected to for a time. You know what Christ as the ransom for your sin did? What he was expected to do and what only he could do for the entire time. Even in heaven today. We talked about it last week. In heaven today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you because nobody can pray for you like God can pray for you. When he became your ransom, he also became your high priest, the New Testament tells us, after the order of Melchizedek. He became your comforter. But that's why he experienced tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin, so that he would be able to minister unto you when you felt those things so that you could overcome them. He didn't just give up his present. He gave up the past, the present, and the future all to become your ransom. My question is, are you willing to become a ransom for the cause of Christ? You know where he went, where the Father told him to go? How many times did the disciples say, Lord, why are we going by that way? Why are we showing up in the gatherings? Why are we going to go down th through Samaria? That's the long way. Plus, there's a whole lot of people down there that will defile us even if we talk to them. Why are we going out of our way to go down there to those half-breeds that don't deserve the blessings of God? But Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because he was a ransom. Not for some, but for all. If you were to become a ransom to the cause of Christ, that means you don't buck regardless of what it is that God tells you or asks you to do. All right, Lord, you want me to go halfway around the world to tell somebody about Jesus? I'll go. No question about it. We'll figure it out along the way, but God said we got to go. We got to go. That's what the Apostle Paul did. He was a little confused and overwhelmed at first. But it was, when it was revealed that he was to be the apostle to the Gentiles, guess where he went? Everywhere that he could to talk to a Gentile. Study your Bible. He went over the entire known world at the time. He was going to go as far as God would let him go. And then some. Every chance he got, what's he doing? He's writing down to remind people. The things that God had entrusted them with that are there to help them. That are there to be a betterment for them. To make them a better Christian. Never once do I find that the Apostle Paul ever tore anybody down. Why? Because he was given over to be a ransom to people's spirituality. Not their salvation. I can't do anything to help you with your salvation. Other than point you at the one that gave me mine. But when it comes to your spirituality. There have been a lot of people in my life that have helped me with my spirituality. A lot of people that have ministered and taught me lessons that they had to learn the hard way. Or when I was in the middle of something, they gave me a little road map that said, hey, this is the way that I went. It may help you, it may not help you, but I've been down this road and it was a little bit easier once we got on that path. Or when I've got questions or I don't understand, there are people that I have confidence that I can ask them, hey, over here in this passage, give me another cross-reference to go and study it out. 
They'd say, oh yeah, I've looked at that before. Let me look at, let me look at my notes and I'll give you a call or I'll text you back. All right, thank you. Right, because no man is an island. There are people that have given themselves over to be an encouragement and a help in your life. Becoming a ransom just means you're willing to do the same for anybody. You can't be a ransomed Christian. A person that gives themselves over for the betterment of another if you've got stipulations on who you're going to help. Doesn't matter where they came from. Doesn't matter what their history is. All that matters is that God's the one that asked you to go over and do it. I don't know what the 12 apostles, or disciples thought, but when they met that madman of Gadara, and they're thinking, what in the world are we going to do to help this fella? They weren't going to do nothing. Jesus is the one that did it. You know why he did it? He didn't do it for the 12 disciples. He did it for that man. One guy. The guy that was heartbroken, by the way, when Jesus told him, no, you can't come with us when we get on this boat. You got to stay here. He had already given himself over the rest of his life. He said, I'm following you. And Jesus said, you can't. But Jesus said, I will let you do this. I will let you stay here and you can be a ransom for the other people of your own kindred over here in the Gadarenes. First time Jesus showed up, they shooed him off. They ran him out of town. You know why? Because they thought that if he had power over the devil and all those demons, that it must mean that he's a devil. They Stupid. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Sure, the devil would have control over other devils, but so would God. That never even entered into their mind. Okay? But you find the next time that Jesus came back, the madman that was no longer mad, he had a great track record of being a witness unto what Jesus had done for him. Why? Because it says that many came out. Not to wait for him to show up to their town. No, no, no. When he came back, they met him on the beach. Multitudes came and ran. Why? Because one man was faithful to give his life over to become a ransom for other people. He said, I wouldn't have what I have right now without Christ, so I'm going to give what I have right now over to Christ totally, completely. If he tells me to go halfway across the world, I will. Some people are willing to do that, but they're not willing to go one house over in the neighborhood. A ransom doesn't get to decide what happens to them. They've given themselves over completely. You're not paying for anybody's sin, but you know what you might be doing? You might be paying to get people through some toll booths to get them access to things that otherwise they never would have heard. They can't make a payment to receive the gospel. The gospel's given. You can't study and look and try to find hard enough to come unto the realization that Jesus is what you need outside of this. Man's been trying to do it since the beginning. That's why they got totem poles and temples to everything in the world except God all over the face of this earth. Because man's been trying to figure out what it takes for them to fix what it is that they're missing. If we were able to figure it out, Christ wouldn't have had to come. And even after Christ came, if you were smart enough to figure it out on your own, he wouldn't have had to have leave or left a church. And if everybody in the world was able to come to their own, even though we've got the internet, and even though we've got all these resources, if people were able to figure it out on their own, God wouldn't have left you here after he saved you. He left you to become a ransom like he became a ransom. Only it's not to pay for people's sins. It may be to pay for somebody's ignorance. You're just willing to go back no matter how many times they've told you they don't want to hear it before. You're willing to pay the price of maybe shame, maybe indignation, maybe of embarrassment because of things that people say to you. Ah, it's nothing. Because if that person goes to hell, they're going to be saying a whole lot worse about me on why I didn't come back to tell them another time. 
They'll be without excuse, but they'll be begging, why didn't you come just one more time? To give your life over as a ransom, you're willing to suffer in the flesh many indecencies, right? Sometimes maybe even atrocities. That's how our Baptist martyrs, our forefathers, were martyred. They were willing to give the flesh over to the atrocities of the world to go through the very fire of judgment here on this earth. All to make a stand and to prove the point that Jesus is worth more than me in my very life. If you've given yourself over as a ransom, that's not a problem. If you've given yourself over as a ransom, you're willing to suffer in this flesh the barbs and the thorns and the pricks of this world because you realize that it's not about the flesh, it's about the spirit. Are you willing to walk different so that somebody else can come to the knowledge of Christ? You willing to have a different sleep schedule because you're up all night with a burden to pray about somebody else? Christ did. Many a time. He'd go up and he'd pray and he'd tell the other disciples, keep watch and pray. You know what he was praying for in those moments? The strength to be what you needed to be or what you needed him to be. Other times he's praying for you that the Father would honor what Christ did in the flesh and reward you with the benefits of it. He prayed that as an example. But when you pray, this is how you ought to pray. You could take that to the bank, by the way. When prayer literally means talking with God and you've got the one that's been talking with them since the beginning, pretty good template. But the son, everything he did was for others. We've heard countless accounts of preachers on what he went through at the Hall of Praetorium and as he walked up the Via Della Rosa and what happened on Calvary, every breath that he took was for you. Every action he did was so that he would be what you needed him to be. My only question is, we've got people that claim to be Christians, but to be Christ-like, you must become ransom for the cause of Christ. It's not about punching in and punching out. I did my time down at the church this week. No, it's either you're in or you're out. That's why the early church made such a difference. It was said of the disciples, by the way, when Peter and John right for healing the fellow at the temple that one day about to pull Bethesda okay they went in they interrogated them and charged them not to preach anymore you know what they said they said aren't these the men that have turned the world upside down you know why they did that because they gave themselves ransom to the cause of Christ you know why all but John of the apostles died a martyr's death because they gave themselves over as a ransom you know why John was out on an island by cast off as an outcast of society by himself they're hoping that he goes insane that they'll never have to hear from him again you know what he's out there doing he says well this would be a great time to just have a little bit of a long time with God the one account that we get of him on the Isle of Patmos guess what he's doing he's in the spirit on the Lord's day worshiping they said, Lord, I'm all yours, whether I'm here, whether I'm there, or you send me anywhere. Let's just get all in and worship today. Those are the people that we would think, right, in hindsight. Oh, well, they're going to get a great reward, and they're going to get the same reward as anybody else. But they learned the key to investing in God's economy. It's not about what you do. It's about how you do it. They become servants. They become ministers. They're more concerned with the needs and the wants of others than they are 
of their own. They're willing to go without so that others may have. They're willing to lose something of their own interest just to see the will of God done in somebody else's life. They're willing to give it all away if it meant that one person would come to the knowledge of Christ. They're willing to do it if nobody ever comes to the knowledge of Christ as a result of their life. Look at Jeremiah. We have no recorded record of one convert that confessed, repented, and got right with God because of what Jeremiah preached for some 40 years. Look at Noah. He preached longer than most people even live. And yet we have no converts. Nobody outside of his immediate family still believed in the things of God. He had a history and a heritage of people that feared God, that walked with God. If you study the lineage of Noah. But all those around him didn't think that was valuable. And yet he preached... God's judgment's coming. Rain's coming. I'm building an ark. And nobody believed him until they heard the thunder roll. Even then, they're like, well, that's weird. Never heard that before. But until that first drop of water fell out of the sky, they still didn't believe that rain was coming. But Noah still forsook all. He didn't know what he was going to find on the other side of the flood. He just knew God wanted him to build a boat, God was going to put him in a boat, and that God was going to keep him safe. He didn't know what was going to be outside of the boat after the waters disappeared. But he still got into the boat. You know how much Noah gave over control of his life unto God? Noah didn't even shut the door to the ark. He got on the boat because God told him to, and he said, God, when you're ready, shut the door. Noah wasn't even concerned about sealing up the entrance to the boat. Why? He said, God will close it when God says it's time. I believe Noah might have been standing there waiting for people to come to the boat. But eventually God said, Noah, I'm shutting the door. And he said, all right, Lord. They was just in there waiting on God to do what God was going to do. Talking about giving everything to Him. You know why the church doesn't have an impact like it used to in the world? Because people stopped giving everything to Him. It became, I'll chisel this much out for God in my calendar this week. Or my schedule will allow me to do this or to do that. When God becomes your schedule, that's when business is about ready to pick up. When you say, Lord, everything I've got is yours, and when he says, okay, let me have that, and you don't resist him, that's when business is about ready to pick up. Because he never asks for something that he doesn't replace it with something better. But when we become attached to what it is that God has blessed us with, that's when we lose our connection with the person that gave us the blessing in the first place. Be a ransom. Say, Lord, let me pay the price so that that person can get what it is they need to get from you. If we start living that way, we'll reach this community. We'll reach the Caribbean. We can reach whoever it is that God desires us to reach because we've removed ourselves as the obstacle. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.